e onde a Rosana vai estar falando? No Zoom. Ah, tá, aqui no Zoom. Rosana, então, tu não vai estar reproduzindo a minha voz aí, né? Eu não sei, eu espero que não. Entendeu? Uhum. Que agora eu tô ouvindo você, mas eu acho que é porque o do Vinícius tá aberto. A hora que ele fechar, eu paro de ouvir a Adriana, não é isso, Vini? Sim, Não entendi, Adriana. Thank you everyone for joining us for the second of a series of lives offered by the Brazilian Association of Researchers in Translation, ABRAPT. Uh, you may send questions anytime through chat on YouTube and Facebook, and Professor Scheffner will answer as many as she can after the lecture. Please remember to subscribe using the link that will be available uh, to you on chat to receive a certificate of attendance. You may also use the chat for doubts. On behalf of Abrapt, I am very honored to have Professor Christina Scheffner at this series of lectures. Professor Scheffner's vast work is very difficult to be summarized, but I will say a few words about it. Christina Schaffner is Professor Emerita at Aston University, where she worked from 1992 until 2015, teaching on the undergraduate and postgraduate courses in translation studies, interpreting, text analysis, research methods, and supervising MA dissertations and PhD students. In September 2015, she retired from her post as professor of translation studies, but she continues to be research active through conference presentations, guest lectures, refereeing work, and as a member of editorial boards of multiple journals. Her main research interests are political discourse in translation, metaphor in translation and translation didactics, and she has published widely on these topics. For several years, she has been a member of the International Cetra Staff, annual summer school for PhD students in translation studies, and was Cetra chair professor in 2011. 
Christina is the author of several books, among them Political Discourse, Media and Translation, co-authored by Susan Besnett, and published by Cambridge Scholars. She's also the author of a number of book chapters and papers, such as Women as, as Translators, uh, as Translation Trainees, and as Translation Scholars. As a professor of translation, I use several of her works in my classes and several colleagues of mine too. Unfortunately, we have never had a chance to meet in person, but every time I or one of my students contact Christina to ask for a paper or help with a translation problem, she was always very helpful. So when I thought of starting the series of lives on behalf of Abrapt, her name was one of the first I thought of. Then I decided to give it a try and invite Christina to give a talk in her, in her prompt response. She hesitated to accept the invitation, but then I explained that her bibliography is so alive among our students and faculty that it would be a great pleasure to have the opportunity to listen to her. To my delight, she replied that I was very persuasive and fortunately she accepted the invitation. So I have the honor to receive Christina Schaffner at our live. Thank you very much, Christina. The floor is now yours. Uh, and the problem starts because I can't get to my PowerPoint anymore. Here we are. Good. Here we are, finally. Uh, thank you very much for this kind introduction and a uh, good afternoon to all of you, to all participants. I'm very grateful to the organizers of this event and to the Abrupt uh, Association for having been thinking of me as a potential speaker for your seminar series. Uh, we all live in difficult times with the corona crisis having affected all of us all over the world. I'm currently in Germany where we have lovely summer weather and sunshine. But obviously uh, our life has not been as normal as it used to be. And also currently, I think we are all talking about how Corona has affected our work, our family life, our plans for the future. And we are talking about the danger that a second wave of the virus may hit us. So when you read in the media about a second wave, obviously we have a metaphor. And this is the topic I would like to talk uh, about today, specifically about metaphor in translation, problems posed by metaphors and solutions of how to deal with metaphor. So one problem which has been raised is Obviously, can metaphor be translated at all? Can we transfer it from one language into another language without any loss? Can we preserve it? In an early paper by Dagu published in 1976, he described metaphor as an individual flash of imaginative insight. A Christina, Christina, I'm sorry to interrupt you. We can't see your screen. I don't know why, I'm sorry. Wait a minute. Actually, we can see your screen, but not your presentation, your PowerPoint. Uh, wait, let, let me try it again. Okay, sure, don't worry. It was perfect a few minutes ago. Ah, yes. Now, yes. Great. Can you see it now? Yes. Yes, can we can see it now. Yeah, perfect. 
went back? Yes, please. I'm sorry. I, I thought you you hadn't started yet, but now it's perfect. Okay, but and you, you but you could understand everything I was saying. Yeah. Yes, we could understand. Okay. Mm -hmm. Right. So now you have you have the text in front of you, as well. Yeah. <laughs> so referring to this definition by Dagu back in 1976, when he talked about metaphor as a product of violating the linguistic system and being very culture specific, and so the argument then was well, it is hardly impossible to transfer metaphor from one language and culture to another, if this may be hampered by linguistic and cultural differences. So for example, in German, which is my mother tongue, when we uh, refer to a controversial, problematic, challenging issue, we speak of a heißes Eisen, a hot iron. So this is a very culture specific phrase, which in, probably cannot be translated literally without any loss. So the question, can it be translated at all was asked at the beginning. But this was soon uh, answered in a more positive way. And people said, yes, of course, metaphor can be translated. Uh, the question is more than how can it be translated or how shall it be translated? How should it be translated? So and scholars came up with a number of methods or procedures which were offered as guidelines to professional translators or also to students of translation. Christina, and I'm, again, I'm again, gone. no, I'm so sorry. Now it, it's no problem with the presentation, but YouTube has just <laughs> disappeared. I'm so very sorry. People, they are there uh, trying to fix the problem. I'm so sorry. C can you hold on just one yes, second? Sure. Just one second, please. Christina, I, I think everything is okay now. I'm sorry, you, you may it. continue. <laughs> Technology is oh, great. Oh <laughs> my God, <laughs> you tell me. <laughs> yeah, but if, if there's any problem, just, just let, let me know and we can always... <laughs> okay, please, please okay. go on. I'm so sorry. The question then asked by scholars was how can or how should metaphor be translated? and translation methods or translation procedures, strategies were suggested. And very often they can be summarized in these three kind of main uh, methods, translating metaphor into the same metaphor, so a direct translation, or translating a metaphor into a different metaphor, which would be a substitution of the image by a target language metaphor which has the same or a similar sense or similar association. So this German example of the hot iron I gave you was rendered in an immediate, in the interpreter immediate press conference into hot potatoes. So this hot iron, hot potato, you have different metaphor. Or a, a, trans, a translation method as a kind of a paraphrase where the metaphor would be turned into sense, so a shift into a non-figurative language. Peter Newmark, a well-known translation studies scholar 
scholar from the United Kingdom, he actually in a book published in 1981 suggested seven translation procedures and he arranged them in the order of preference. So what should we do ideally and then what is the less, least preferred method? So obviously for him, then reproducing the same image in the target language would be the ideal solution. So in English, when you have a ray of hope, this can be a French expression is similar, rayon d'espoir, or you replace the image in the source language with a standard image in the target language, which does not clash with the target language culture. So an example here, we have other fish to fry. In French, this would be an autre chat à fouetter, which would be literally other cats to whip. So it's a different image. Translating metaphor by simile is the third message he has. So simile is a comparison, explicit comparison. And he has examples here, mainly French and, and English ones. His own cryptuaire come from a, a, a scientific or scholarly article by Roland Barr. So the cryptian zones, which he then, the similarity would then be the crypt-like areas. So in, in explicit similarity. Translating metaphor by simile plus sense, the vocabulaire Moliere-esque, so you get a long kind of paraphrase. This means a whole repertoire of medical quackery such as Moliere might have used. You see examples come from scholarly articles and uh, literature as well. Fifth method, converting metaphor to sense. So here the metaphor, the figurative language disappears. In German, you have sein Brot verdienen, which is literally to earn one's bread. And translating it by sense would turn this phrase into to earn one's living. Yeah, so bread is the metaphorical expression, but living is not metaphorical. The deletion of metaphor, if it is redundant, so he doesn't really uh, advocate deletion. And uh, if it is a very creative, innovative metaphor, he also suggests it could be translated as the same metaphor, but combined with the sense. So an explanation, non-metaphoric explanation added. And in this way, the image of the metaphor could be enforced. So, but this is linked obviously to the question, what is metaphor? How do we define metaphor? And in a traditional view, metaphor was described as this is a matter of language. Metaphor is a figure of speech. It's a linguistic expression, which is substituted for another expression, which a literal meaning. So my earning one's bread, turning into earn one's living. So you would hear you have a, this metaphor of the bread could actually be substituted by the non-metaphorical expression. And it was argued that why do we need metaphors at all? Saying, well, it's mainly used for stylistic embellishment of the text. So more literary uh, aesthetic function. But then in translation studies, scholars or the research has moved on. And Gideon Turi said, well, we cannot only ask questions about how should a metaphor be translated and using individual words or uh, phrases or idioms as example, we should actually look at authentic translations and investigate how metaphor have actually been translated in authentic text. And he argued said that in these kind of procedures as those seven suggested by Newmark, the starting point was all, always a metaphor as a problem in the source text. And then we looked into how can we solve this problem. But Turi said, well, when we also look at the translation at the target text, we will find metaphors. And the metaphor can also be a solution in the target text. And in addition to these kind of free standard methods, metaphor into same, metaphor into different, metaphor, metaphor into paraphrase, he suggested that there are two different, uh, two additional procedures. Namely, we can find a metaphor in the target text where there was not a metaphorical expression in the source text, so pretty much something like paraphrase into metaphor, or a metaphor could also be added to a target text when you don't see any linguistic motivation for it in the source text. 
So this was from the perspective of descriptive translation studies, so looking at authentic translations. Um, since the 1980s, we see a new definition of metaphor, namely a conceptual approach. And this has been inspired or stimulated primarily by the book by George Lakoff and Mark Johnson, Metaphors We Live By. And they say that metaphor is not just a decorative element so used for embellishing the style of a text, but metaphors are basic resources for thought processes in human society. So it's not a matter of language as initially or rich traditionally understood, but metaphor is a matter of thought, of thinking. So metaphor as a cognitive device for forming and communicating conceptualizations of reality. So metaphor is a means to understand one domain of experience, a target domain, which is often an abstract domain, in terms of another one, a more concrete source domain. And the source domain is mapped onto the target domain. And in this mapping process, structural components of the source-based schema are transferred to the target domain. Kovacs speaks here of ontological correspondences for the structural element. And this also allows for knowledge-based inferences and entailments, epistemic correspondences. I'll give you an example. So metaphor is the label used for the conceptual mapping. And one example is when we want to talk about anger or what is anger. This is can be seen as a, a conceptual metaphor that anger is understood in terms of the heat of a fluid in a container. So the source domain would be the heat of fluid in the container. And Lakeup Johnson and other scholars working in on the conceptual approach to metaphor, they use capital letters for this conceptual metaphor, for this mapping. And then how this conceptual metaphor is expressed in language, these are the linguistic expressions or metaphorical expressions, which are based on this conceptualization and sanctioned by the mapping. So when we have the conceptual mapping, anger is the heat of a fluid in a container, and we speak about anger, so we, if we uh, use a phrase like, I gave vent to my anger, so this would be a linguistic expression or metaphoric expression. So we have a mapping here. The body, the human body is a container. The heat of the fluid is the anger. So these are these mapping of the elements, the ontological correspondences. And then when we know about how liquid behaves in a container when it's get heated. So the, once the fluid is heated past a certain limit, pressure increases to a point at which the container explodes. So this is what happens in the source domain of liquid getting hot in a container and mapped onto anger. So this also means then that when my anger goes beyond a certain limit, then the pressure increases to a point at which the person loses control. So that's when I can give vent to my anger. Other of these conceptual metaphors, uh, also Lake of St. Johnson illustrated, uh, is the metaphor argument is war. So we talk about arguments we have in a similar way as we are talking about war. So war being a concrete source domain, argument a more abstract target domain. So examples here of the metaphoric expressions, the opponent's claims were shot down in flames. I had to defend my opinion. Or um, it was said at, in the, during the introduction that I have worked also on political discourse in translation and quite a lot of my examples also linked to metaphors also come from political discourse. And in political discourse, quite a common metaphor is that politics is conceptualized as movement along a path towards a destination. Yeah? And here are a few examples which you find in authentic text, which illustrate this conceptual metaphor. 
there is still a long way to go to achieve this. We have taken steps to pay down our debts. And so very often when we talk about political decisions, we come across formulations like, we are now at the crossroads, we have to turn back, we have taken important steps, more steps have to be taken to reach our destination. So what about translation procedures then? So these traditional ones, metaphor into same, metaphor into different, uh, how do they apply when we talk about metaphor as a mapping, a conceptual mapping? And in order to find this out, scholars have asked questions like then, how have translators actually handled metaphorical expressions? And is there evidence of any awareness of conceptual metaphors? And because what we as translators encounter are the linguistic expressions, the metaphorical expressions. So the conceptual metaphor, the mapping, is not immediately visible in the text. So do translators, are they aware of the conceptual metaphor or do they focus on the expressions, the linguistic expression? And what has been done to find out answers to this question? Source text and target text have been compared, so product analyses. Also, a uh, comparison of different translations of the same source text into different target languages. So you have a larger corpus on seeing how different translators working into different languages have dealt with the same problem. And um, Abdullah Al-Harasi from Oman he conducted research on translation of speeches by the Omani uh, leader from Arabic into English, looking at metaphors. And he used this conceptual metaphor theory and then came up with a whole list of alternative translation procedures, just given you here to using different conceptual metaphors, same mapping, but a different perspective. So these procedures look quite different to the ones which have traditionally been used. So just want to give you two examples here for looking at metaphorical expression and the conceptual metaphor which sanctions it. Again, examples from my political text here, German English. In the German text, you have a reference under the roof of a European employment pact and Dach, roof. In the English translation, they speak of the umbrella under the umbrella of a European employment pact. But when you look at it from the conceptual point of view, you can say that both dach, roof, and umbrella are metaphorical expressions, but the conceptual metaphor is a more general one. Being protect, protected is being under a cover. So the cover, both the roof and the umbrella protect you. Uh, so the cover is different. So traditionally, people would say you have diff metaphor into a different metaphor if you just look at metaphor as a linguistic phenomenon. But from this conceptual point of view, you can say the conceptual metaphor is actually the same. You are protected under some cover yeah? and the cover is speci specified differently. Or another example here, referring to um, the start of a project, which in uh, the German sentence has, uh, it was at the uh, G7 summit in Britain, where we together with the American president fired or gave the, the, the starting pistol shot. So you fire a pistol, uh, so which is a phrase which indicates the start of a race. So if you have your 100 meter sprint, so the, you would have the fire firing of the pistol to say now off you go. In the English translation, this has been turned into the, uh, we, we kicked this off during the presidency. So kick off is what you have in football, uh, in a sporting competition. But in both cases, you have a conceptual metaphor, which is starting a sporting competition. So again, you might say at the level of language, it's a different metaphor, but you could also say, well, the conceptual metaphor actually is the same. What we have are different metaphorical expressions. But when you look at translations, if you compare translations to their source text, if you do product analysis, we need to be aware that the product, the 
text is the result of cognitive processes. Translation always happens under specific conditions, sociocultural, historical conditions, the institutional context. We need to be aware of the purpose of our translation, for whom are we translating the text, aspects of genre and language will be relevant. Also the individual translator, personality traits, time pressure and whatnot. So there are multiple courses which may have an impact on what decision a translator takes in the end. So when we are just looking at the product alone, we can at best speculate about the process that has led to it. So by looking at the translated text, we cannot actually retrace the pathways of the translator's decision-making procedures. Any solution to this? Translation process research. So people or scholars interested in investigating the actual process of translation, they are interested in finding out what is actually going on, what happens in the translator's mind while they are translating. And in relation to metaphor, then the question would be, well, are metaphors processed differently? Are we engaging, cognitively engaging with metaphor differently compared to other linguistic features? And um, some experimental settings have been used to investigate questions like these, also saying is metaphor more difficult to translate? And I will give you some examples of uh, such research and the methods which have been used. So process research methods, think aloud protocols. This is, you ask a translator to translate a text and while they are translating the text, you ask them to verbalize, to speak about everything they are doing and thinking. And this verbalization of the translator is then recorded and transcribed so that you have a translation, a think aloud protocol tab and uh, monologues and also dialogues uh, have been used. So two, two translators translating together and talking to each other. So it gives richer material. Uh, another method is keystroke logging. This means when you are sitting at your computer, you are typing your translation and the software, there's one software called Translog. This is the original keystroke logging um, system which was developed in Denmark. So everything you type, every key is recorded. So also when there are pauses in the process, the, the seconds of the pauses, the length of the pauses is recorded. When you go back, when you delete in the text, all this is recorded. So you can get a transcript then of the, of the, the keystroke movements. And sometimes these keystroke logging has been used with retrospective interviews with translators, so showing them how their translation emerged and asking questions. And it has also been combined with think aloud protocols. And even more combination, eye tracking. So translators working at a computer and there's software which can capture, capture the eye movement so that you can record where you are looking, how long you are looking um, at the screen. And very often we have the split screen that the source text is at the bottom and the target text at the top or vice versa. And again, this kind of eye tracking uh, software has been combined with keystroke logging or with retrospective interviews and or with think aloud protocols. A few examples. So already back at the beginning of the century, Sonja Tilkun Kontit and Kati Matikainen, scholars from Finland, they tested the a cognitive translation hypothesis, which says that metaphorical expressions take more time and are more difficult to translate if they exploit a different cognitive domain than the target language equivalent expression. So what did they do? They used think aloud protocols. So they measured the time and the length of their uh, tap segments. So how much time do translators spend on speaking about a problem they encountered in translating metaphor? They counted the number of lines of the target text produced. So this also included revision. Yeah? So everything you, you, you type. And then uh, they also asked the translators how satisfied they were with their own translation solutions. 
So just to give you an example here, um, they had translations from English into Finnish. And uh, in the text, they encountered the metaphorical expression to be out of one's depth, which reflects a vertical dimension. So a domain of a vertical dimension out of a depth. And there is no immediate Finnish equivalent, similar to my hot iron. Huh? So no immediate uh, equivalent, which would be the same image. So the closest equivalent would be not to have a clue, but this is no longer a vertical dimension, but it's a domain of detective work. So what they discovered when they looked at the think aloud protocols, so they found out that translating this metaphorical expression took longer, so more time was spent on it. There was more verbalization, so translators spent quite an, an amount of speech reflection about the problems they had in translating this particular metaphorical expression. And they also found more potential translation solutions. And we all know that when 10 translators translate the same text, you don't end up with 10 exact same, in, in exactly the same translations. There's always variation, but they found more variations uh, for these metaphoric expressions. So they concluded then that for a translator to search for another conceptual domain causes a delay in the translation process. And also if you don't have an immediate uh, metaphorical equivalent, there is more uncertainty in the translation of these different domain metaphors. Keystroke logging. Ant Lücke Jakobsen in Denmark, who is actually the creator of this translog software. So he, um, they measured the processing time for um, idiomatic metaphorical expressions. And they found out that um, these metaphorical expressions slowed down the translation process. So it, there were more pauses, which indicates that translators were thinking, so they must have encountered a problem. Claudia Förster Hegren is from Bergen University in Norway. She also used keystroke logging to um, looking at translation strategies that involved a conceptual change, so a different conceptual mapping which also goes hand in hand with different linguistic items, so like the one out of depth and the clue, which I just showed you. And she also found that the production time, so the time until the target text was produced, had increased. So this must be a problem. Paul Kosmol from Germersheim in Germany, he used translog, this keystroke logging, um, followed up by retrospective interviews, five professional translators translated the same text from English into German. And as can be expected, he noticed enormous differences in the target texts. So here's an extract from the source text. It's about European integration and it's rich in metaphorical expressions. So we come across a two tier community. So talking about the European Union divided between the pace setters and the rest. Quite obvious who the pace setters are determined to be, and they may not accept us as partners. They will never allow us to impose a break. And uh, some translators had opted for, for the Franco-German alliance, which is not metaphorical here, but introduced the metaphoric expression in the target text by speaking about the German-French engine or for the two-tier community, which is like a structure, two tiers, um, they changed it into two-speed Europe, European Union, or European Union of two speeds. And when he talked to the translators then about what motivated their decisions, so they came up with a, with a variety of arguments. So some said, well, I was aware of how the press, the German press, talks about European Union and problems in European integration. So the awareness of structures used in the press and typical wording motivated me then to opt for the engine or for the two speeds. Uh, others refer to the translation corpus. So this had to be a newspaper text. Others said, well, I was thinking of the overall target text which would emerge. So I wanted to have it coherent Others argued about stylistic considerations. So you had 
uh, pace setters twice in the source text. He said, well, in German, you would not have the same word in so close vicinity, so you would opt for um, a synonym. So his conclusion then, the decisions for dealing with metaphors are manifold. So we cannot reduce translational problems in translating metaphor by coming up with a list of solutions and now you just pick one. Eye tracking, so the assumption underlying this kind of research is that there is a correlation between the time we just fixate on the word and the amount of processing that takes place. So if we read a text and we spend more time looking at one particular word, this seems to indicate that processing is happening more slowly, not so automatically. Annette Sjörop from Denmark, she did her PhD research on uh, conceptual or cognitive aspects of metaphor translation using eye tracking. And her hypothesis was that translators dwell longer over the processing complexities involved in translating a metaphor than a non-metaphorical concept. So she also had experimental settings where professional translators translated from English into Danish, same kind of text. And then she measured uh, the, the, the eye uh, fixation or the duration, how long translators were looking. There's specific software. So additionally, uh, initially you had to wear heavy glasses so that uh, the eye movement and fixation time could be measured. But now there is software which is integrated into the screen. So this is less intrusive for, for a researcher. So she then compared uh, the fixation times and duration when translators have looked at to deal with particular metaphorical expressions in the text compared to non-metaphorical language. And she found indeed that there was a longer fixation time for metaphors compared to non-metaphorical language. So metaphors seem to be a problem or more difficult to translate or require more cognitive effort. She also then in a, in a follow-up study, she came up with a, a second hypothesis linking translation strategy and gaze time. And her hypothesis was that the choice of a translation strategy would have an effect on the cognitive effort involved in metaphor translation and hence an effect on the gaze times. So her strategies were the more like traditional ones, although she used a conceptual uh, approach to metaphor. But her strategy is use of direct metaphoric equivalent, another metaphorical phrase or paraphrasing. And she found that there seems to be a higher cognitive load for paraphrasing. So translators spent more time, also looked at particular phrases, uh, uh, spend more time for looking at particular phrases in the source text when they opted then for a paraphrase as a translation strategy. And she concluded saying, well, this higher cognitive load for paraphrase seems to be due to two shifts which are involved in the decision making. So there's one shift from one domain to another, and then it's also a shift from metaphorical expressions to literal ones, so non-metaphorical ones, which would indicate the length of the time. And more recently, you have a research which uses multi-methods. So where scholars use data from different experimental settings, for example, um, in, in, it's at Zurich at the University um, for Applied Sciences at Zurich, Gary Massey and uh, Maureen Ernstberger-Dau they have used a combination or triangulation of data, which they gathered from screen recordings. So when you work at the computer, you can do a film of kind of recording of the screen. So where you see when translators move between source text, target text, you can see when they go to the internet for doing some research, some, some search, all this is recorded, uh, these screen recordings. And they have combined it with keystroke logs and with eye tracking, retrospective verbal commentaries gained from the translators and looking at the target text products. So to see what solutions the translators had opted for. 
And uh, in one study, Gary Messe used BAMA students and professional translators who translated from German into English. And then a follow-up study, um, they used professional translators, advanced MA students and beginner BA students. And they were translating into their first language, which was either English or German. They have good facilities at the University in Zurich uh, because you need the hardware, the software, and then you need the volunteers who come to, do, to, to sit for these tests and have their eye movements fixed and then uh, recordings being done. But it's interesting because you, you learn quite a lot about your own uh, translation practice as well and how aware you are of metaphors and, and um, what, what decision making you do. So what did they find out? So in the first study, Gary Messi noticed obviously differences between the three groups, but there were more similarities between the uh, translation decisions, the behavior, the arguments they came up with in the uh, retrospective commentaries. So more similarities between the advanced master students and the professional translators. And he was wondering then say, well, could it be that training has a significant role to play when it comes to handling conceptual metaphors. And um, in, in the follow-up study then, they discovered differences in the behavior of professional translators working into English or working into German. So there is also a question of does the language direction have an impact or have an influence on how aware translators are of conceptual metaphors. So when you have and I talk about awareness of conceptual metaphors, so it's a question of when you talk to translators, well, you have opted for this solution here. What made you come up with this one? Or if you have the keystroke logging record printout and you see a translator typed a particular phrase for a start and then changed it into another one maybe changing an initial metaphorical expression into a paraphrase or vice versa. Yeah. You could then ask them retrospectively, showing them the results. Can you remember what you were thinking? Why did you do this? Yeah. And then you can see in the arguments whether they talk about, oh, this is a word for which we don't have a word in our uh, mother tongue, or whether they are talking about conceptual domains like this has to do with movement or I wanted to have a coherence about the pace setter or the, the engine and the braking also. And this is something which as part of a training process, so this awareness for conceptual elements or metaphor being matters of thinking uh, can, be, can be developed by discussing or openly discussing it. So conclusion then, we don't have clear cut solutions to say, well, here's a matter where that's what we do, but there are still quite a lot of open questions. So what has been discovered is that in authentic translations, texts produced by translators, and we're talking about human translation here, so not machine translation, so that an attempt to provide a direct metaphorical equivalent in the target language does not seem to be the default strategy. Yeah. Because it was very often you, uh, assumed, or oh, you have a metaphorical expression in the source language, you automatically would look for the most immediate metaphorical expression in the target language. So Peter Newmark's first strategy, which he preferred. But this is not the case. So you also see that metaphorical expressions in the source text are immediately rendered as a paraphrase in the target text or changed back into, into metaphors later on. It is also impossible to determine how the cognitive load is distributed between metaphor interpretations and understanding of what is the uh, conceptual domain behind, what is actually meant by the metaphor, uh, the choice of a translation strategy and the target text formulation. So this, for example, if there are pauses in the typing which you notice when you use keystroke logging software and you see there is a pause which comes immediately before the target text 
rendering of a metaphoric expression in the source text is typed. So there may be different reasons for this pause. So it can be that the translator is thinking about what actually is meant by this source text expression, this metaphoric expression. It could be that they are thinking about how shall I render this into my target text. Yeah, and the same is true with Gaystein. So looking at a particular expression in the source text and spend more time with looking at it in the source text does not automatically have to mean you are thinking about how do I interpret this expression. You could also be thinking about how shall I render it in the target text. So there is not yet clear evidence of how these processes or this cognitive load is structured. And uh, for future research, the most promising steps seem to be these multi-methods approaches, the most recent ones, also thanks to new software, new hardware, because combining data from keystroke logging, keystroke logging, eye tracking, talking to translators is um, something where you can gather data and see how they are relating to each other. Because one problem also with think aloud protocols is, but it's difficult to do it. So just imagine if you are translating a text and you are asked to speak about what you are doing, what you are thinking. Thinking is much quicker than speaking. And not everything you are thinking, you are aware of is conscious thinking. Yeah? So what, what people are saying is not necessarily 100% identical to what you are thinking. And it's also the problem um, for other methods as well. Is the researcher present in the room or not? Because sometimes um, translators or students of translation may be worried saying, oh, this is my teacher who is doing the research and that's what they want me to say or that's what they want to hear. So there's always a certain amount of uncertainty. And as I said before, the initial eye tracking when you had to wear this heavy gadget is not, not that easy. There's some current, some new research also using uh, neuroscience, so where brain activities are measured, but you can't actually be put in the tube with cables attached to your head and do a translation yeah? or blood pressure measurements linked to translating of particular metaphoric expressions in text. So there's a lot of research going on and all meant to help us understand better how translators are actually engaging with metaphoric expressions in the text. And it's only if we have sufficient insights into what's actually happening and what role also socio-cultural context, institutional requirements, genre specificities, purposes, uh, translators' uh, individual identity, what effect they have on the process, then can, once we have better knowledge, then can be turned it into um, insights for training, but not in the sense like, I give you seven rules and that's how you do it, but more in the sense of raising more awareness for a more in-depth engagement with the text to understand it and reflecting about the purpose of translation to, um, to help us achieve higher quality and uh, recognition in our professional status. I can uh, leave the presentation with you because if you want to read a bit more of the examples I have given you, so there are a few slides here with the bibliographical references which you can use. And if you have any questions which you don't feel like asking tonight or there's no time to ask them, you're always welcome to write to me. That's my email address. So you can always contact me. And if I'm able to answer or direct you to somebody else who might be better able to answer than, than I am, so I'm always helpful. Well, that's, that's it then. Thank you very much for listening. Do I say stop share now? What do I do? Yes, yes, you can stop sharing. Okay. Thank you so much, Christina. This is such a fantastic topic and your presentation was also very nice and enlightening. So I'm sure, well, I have lots of comments here thanking for everything, but unfortunately I can't read all of them. We have uh, people from Brazil and abroad as well. 
I was sure it would happen because as I told you, many, many people here uh, know your work very well. So uh, thank you so much. There are some questions here and I think if you have time to, to, to answer them. And of course, and other questions, as you said, people can email you and Christina is one of the scholars who answer <laughs> emails. So I'm sure she will get to an answer for, for everything. And well, first I would like to, to read uh, Felipe's question Felipe is the translator, the, uh, uh, the Brazilian translator who translated your uh, paper. And he's asking you if you would agree that the functionalist approach to translation may help to gu guide the translation of conceptual met metaphorical expressions. Yes. <laughs> Short answer is yes. But I think in general, a, a functionalist approach is very helpful for practical translation and also for training purposes. Because the main point of functionalism is you, it's the purpose which your target text is to fulfill in for target audience, which determines how you translate. So it's not the traditional view translation has to be a immediate a direct reproduction of whatever is there in the source text. So looking at this kind of target oriented approach is helpful for dealing with all kinds of translation problems. Yeah? And this would also apply to metaphor. And that's what I said, it's probably, when you, you can link it to this conceptual approach of metaphor, because if you have a particular expression in the source text, like let's say my, my hot iron example, yeah, and you talk about it and say, oh, but um, in in English or in French or in Portuguese, we don't use this image of the iron. We use something else. So, if you think about translation has to be as close to the source text as possible, you would may you may be translated as iron. Yeah, but thinking about what is the purpose of your text, we just need to understand then the decision will then be now I need to find, do we have a metaphoric expression and what actually is the kind of underlying conceptual mapping which we have here. But also if the purpose is my target text reader wants to see exactly how the source text was formulated, they are interested in typical German wordings, then obviously you would translate it literally. And then maybe at a comment, a translator's note, or a footnote. Yeah. So I think functionalism in general, since it makes you think about purposes, audience, culture specific aspects, wider consequences of, of your decisions, is very useful for all problems in translation, be it metaphor or, or not. Okay, very and good. And thank you also for having translated this article. <laughs> okay, we thank you. Uh, and Philip is also asking you if you would recommend any further readings on the cognitive approach to matter for translation. Um, in, in, the, in the PowerPoint, you have a few references there. Um, there is also, I, mean, I, can, can send, I can send you maybe a few other uh, titles in the in, in, in the email, which, which you're welcome to share with others. So I've just finished an article, a chapter together with Paul Chilton, a colleague of mine who has also worked on metaphor, not from the translation perspective, but it's a joint chapter for the Routledge Handbook on Translation and Cognition. Mm -hmm. And this is about um, ma mainly about process, cognitive processes related to metaphor in translation. This book will be out later this year. Yeah, it hasn't been published yet, yeah, but I can okay. send you if um, I can send you directly to Philip. I can send a few a few references. Great, thank you very much. Uh, let me see here. My T. Siqueira, she's a colleague of mine. Uh, she's asking you if you know of any recent reference fr uh, from neuroscience on metaphor uh, processing. Is there anything? 
Um, New? I, I have I have a, a, an ex, a, a short example, I think, in this article I just mentioned for this handbook. There is um, a colleague, Bing, Bing Han Shong, Chong Bing Han, sorry, <laughs> he's a, is a Chinese colleague but works in, in, in the UK. Uh, at Durham University, and he has been doing some research on uh, neuroscience, also together with uh, neuroscientists on um, metaphor as well. So it's um, it's relatively new research. So it's not not that much I can can uh, tell you specifically about what he, what he has found. But I can send you uh, the reference, which maybe. But that's what I briefly hinted at. Uh, with neuroscience, it's actually difficult to set up this kind of experimental setting. You know, so how do you get to to the brain? <laughs> yeah. and also, if you ask people, to, if you look at eye gaze or the, the way they are typing, and again, there's so much variation. You know, the speed of typing, how competent are you in typing, has also an effect on how long it takes you and how many pauses there are. You know, it's, it's not easy to have this link always between a pause and is it related to the metaphor or what is it? True, true, That's very nice. Something which uh, I think we'll, we will see more research with neuroscience also as new technology may become available, which is less intrusive also for translators. Okay, thank you. Well, uh, Laura is thanking you for the talk and uh, she asks, would you say that being aware of the cognitive effects of metaphor is beneficial for the translator during a translation process? Hmm. It probably is, but it's also, I think it's related to the time you actually have for the translation and the conditions under which you are working. So very often professional translators, they have their deadlines and they have to submit, produce their text relatively quickly. Um, if you do have time to do it, then becoming aware of conceptual issues is obviously something which, which is, can, can be helpful because it helps you then also deciding, or maybe you, your, your scope your range of translation variations becomes larger. Mm -hmm. If you are thinking about, well, this is actually linked to what I had with my with the roof and the umbrella, for example. Mm -hmm. If you say, well, this is linked to some kind of protection, what else can be, how else can I be protected? Mm -hmm. So instead of just roof and umbrella, you may come up with two or three other variations. And it does not have to be a, a noun metaphoric expression, which is a noun replaced by another metaphoric expression, which is a noun. Mm -hmm. so you can have, for example, with my politics is movement metaphor. So when you have something which is like the path or a long way in the source text, it can become a verbal phrase. So we have to travel for a longer period of time or something like this. Mm -hmm. So the thing you become, but I think it would need to be tested some kind of research of what actually happens when, when translators do this, when they become aware. So does it, I mean, some of the research which I showed you of the research using think aloud protocols, we said, mm -hmm. well, if there is this kind of metaphor or metaphoric expression where you don't have an immediate equivalent in the target language, so that they discovered more solutions, but obviously more solutions by different translators. So mm -hmm. they did further specify whether 10 translators, 10 different tra solutions, or whether eight solutions came from one translator and the two distributed between the others. Yeah. So I think this could be some interesting research to see whether also when, when you ask translators to comment about their solutions, when you see that in their discussion, they refer to these conceptual metaphors, yeah, we'll mm -hmm. say this, to, to buildings or construction. I was looking for something that is construction. Or, or movement, uh, whether this results in, in um, a larger range of potential solutions they are looking at or, or not. So it's, it's difficult to, to say yes, it does or not, but I think it's always when you have research and then you have results, 
it's interesting. Then you can see this has been tested, tested. But it's also if you have one test, let's say with five translators, it's not necessarily representative because the language combination may play a role, the genre of the text you are translating, the setting, your, your training, your experience, your own personality, your attitude towards the task. Yeah? So the more results you have, the better it becomes possible to, to vaguely or carefully generalize. Mm -hmm. But it also gives you new ideas to say, okay, this is not really convincing. This hasn't shown this. So let's do more research at new methods, see whether uh, the findings will, will be the same or whether language direction does have an impact. Okay, thank you. Uh, let me see here. Um, Alexei is asking you, uh, how, would you how would translation of metaphor differ from the one of metonymy? Uh, <laughs> that's, a demo, that's a terminological conceptual problem. In um, cognitive or conceptual metaphor theory, as Lakoff and Johnson have presented it, or others like Kovacic or um, uh, Chilton, they don't make a difference between metaphor and metonymy. So they treat metonym, metonymy in, in the same way as metaphor, as a mapping process. So not mapping between domains, but also mapping it between part, part and whole. But also um, when this conceptual theory of metaphor as developed by Lake of Johnson is not the only conceptual theory of metaphor. There is also a theory which is called blending theory, which I'm, don't ask me about it. So I don't really know much about blending theory, but also this conceptual view to metaphor is also evolving. So the scholars working with this view have also discovered particular weaknesses in the work by Lakoff and Johnson. And also um, Lakoff and Johnson when this was the first time that they referred to meta as a conceptual element, it's very convincing. Yeah? So I think it's very convincing. But a lot of examples they have are not authentic texts, but phrases, expressions taken into a database, taken from, from dictionaries, for example. So scholars who have worked with metaphor also on the basis of a conceptual metaphor theory, but looking at authentic texts, also see that there is more variation and also incoherent sometimes, particularly in, in journalistic text. Journalists mix metaphors. So you speak in one sentence about constructing a particular, let's say is constructing the European Union and say, this is the cornerstone or this treaty is the cornerstone of uh, our policy and the next step will have to be. So you have a construction immediately followed by a movement metaphor. Mm -hmm. This kind of mixed metaphors, which you find in authentic texts, is something um, which is also has been discovered when you look at text and you look at argumentation, how metaphors function, what the role of metaphors is in constructing particular images. Yeah. But I think it's, mm -hmm. it's useful also in, in the, I mentioned the corona crisis at the beginning. So when you talk about the crisis in terms of a wave, so the association with the wave is the worry, the danger. So you can influence people's thinking, you can influence decisions, policies mm -hmm. to be taken mm -hmm. by analyzing the language which we use. Or you speak about killing the virus, no? so it's a war. No? So that's yeah. what I find very, very interesting. So the first time I was made familiar with this conceptual theory. So it opened a whole new world to me. Uh, mm -hmm. And the more you are aware of it, and the more you see these conceptual metaphors in the text. And that's why I think also in, in translation, so that it allows a deeper engagement with text. So not just going, here's the first word, I don't know it, I look it up in my dictionary. Uh, and I don't find a word in my dictionary, so what shall I do now? But this kind of deeper engagement with the text reflecting about it 
and, and that's why I find this this approach useful. But it has its weaknesses and it has its critics. Mm -hmm. I see. Well, we had more questions, but unfortunately, we don't have more time, and the interpreters need to rest. Mainly Adriana because she's alone, and they they should have the shift. So, uh, well, I'm so sorry. I need to stop, but. I do have my questions myself, and but I will email you, okay? And, and also the other questions we received. So, Christina, I would like to thank you so much for the talk, for your patience, for you are very nice and you are very uh, helpful as well. So it was a great pleasure to, to listen to you this afternoon. And I would like to thank the audience for the presence and the smart questions and comments. You were very nice, lovely. And uh, thank you, uh, the board of Abrapt and especially Vinicius Martins for helping me organize this live. And then Swelling and the other monitors, Jennifer, uh, Danielle, who helped the participants throughout the presentation. And I am very grateful for the interpreters who made it possible for speakers of Brazilian Sign Language and Brazilian Portuguese to take the most of this wonderful talk. So thank you very much, Sandro Fonseca, my colleague at Murgis, and Vanise Flores, uh, UFSPA, for the interpretation in sign language, and Adriana Neves, Tradsu, for the Portuguese inter interpretation. And I would also like to thank Urgis post-graduation program and CAP is for supporting and promoting this series of lives. And please, everyone, stay tuned for the next lives of Abrapt. Next week, at the same time, we'll have Elena Pralas, who will talk about interpretation with the lecture Omnipresence and Invisibility of Interpreters Accompanying High-Level Officials. So see you all uh, next week. And one more time, Christina, thank you so much. We had over 200 viewers uh, on YouTube and almost uh, more than 20 on Facebook. So it was uh, a success and of course, uh, because of you. <laughs> uh, thank you, thank you very much. I would also like to thank the interpreters, but in particular, and thanks to all the audience and all of you stay safe, stay healthy so that you can enjoy all the other talks to come. And thank you very much for the organization. Thank you. I'm sorry for the little problems we had, but okay. at the end, it was perfect. Good. Thank you. Okay. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.